Saddleworth Moor, a place dripping in natural beauty, history and folklore, but with a dark and violent past. Monday the 2nd of April, 1832. Saddleworth Moor unleashed another dark segment of its grisly past. A murder where two men were slain in bloody savagery. This is a story of a murder most foul. Still unsolved after nearly 200 years. These were the original Moore's murders. Hi guys and welcome. I'm Pinart Reports Unmasked. I've decided to continue my channel without the mask. So this is me folks, I, I hope my, my real face doesn't scare you all away now, so <laughs> I hope you stick by me now. But anyway, so on to today's story, and I'm here in Saddleworth Moor. Look at this, it's misty, gee whiz, and there's been some murders around here, let me tell you. So Saddleworth, it's a beautiful place. Stories occupy every nook and cranny of this wild corner of Britain. The story most people associate with Saddleworth Moor is that of the Moor's murders of the 1960s. A desperately sad story of five murders committed by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley that devastated the nation and it still hangs like a dark cloud over this area today. But these were not the first murders to happen on the moor at Saddleworth Moor, or to even gain national notoriety. For that, we need to step back to 1832. The Moorcock Inn, also known to the locals as Billow Jacks. A solid stone building that clung to the steep hillside of Greenfield Road. Built to brave the harsh and wild weather often received in this area. It was a welcome sight for many a weary traveller. The landlord of the pub at the time was William Bradbury, aged 84 years old or Billow Jacks, as he was known. He was known as Billow Jacks from the local manner of naming men after their fathers. This is how the Moorcock Inn came to be known as Billow Jacks. Bill lived there with his son, Thomas, aged 46 years old. Thomas had a fiery temper and was not a popular man, due to numerous run-ins on the moor with locals, for taking peat, cutting heather and poaching the local livestock. But on Monday the 2nd of April in 1832, the Moorcock Inn 
witnessed a gruesome and horrific murder that remains unsolved to this very day. This is their story. On the evening of Monday, the 2nd of April, in 1832, Tom returned home to the Moorcock Inn after a day out on the moors. He was with his long-time family friend, Reuben Platt. Tom's father, Bill, was out at the time. Tom had to go to the nearby village of Greenfield to gather supplies from the shop, which was just under two miles away. Reuben decided to walk with Tom, so they locked up the pub and headed for Greenfield. Walking down the narrow dirt road in the direction of Greenfield, they met Bill who was on his way back to the pub. Tom gave him the door key to get back in, and after a brief exchange of words, Tom and Reuben then carried on with their journey. Further down the long dirt path, they approached three men resting at the side of the road. One of the men asked Tom in an Irish accent, how long would it take to get to Homeforth? How long to get to Homeforth? Tom replied, about eight miles, and they continued on. The three Irishmen walked back in the direction of the Moorcock Inn. Thomas and Reuben walked hesitantly slow, eagerly looking back until the strange men passed the pub. Tom said to Reuben that he was uneasy about these men and was worried his father Bill was in the pub by himself. But the strangers passed right by it, so the sense of panic felt by Tom was subsided and they carried on with their journey. After reaching Greenfield, the two friends parted. This was the last time Reuben saw Tom. After getting supplies from the shop, Tom headed back to the Moorcock Inn. The next morning, Bill's granddaughter, 12-year-old Amelia, came to the pub on an errand. The front door was unlocked. So she entered. Grandad, Uncle Tom. What she witnessed would have scarred the poor girl for life as she quickly made a sickening discovery. A mass of clotted gore met her as she entered the pub. Peering through the blood-splattered wall, she saw Tom, who was laying face down in a pool of his own blood. His clothes soaked almost entirely in congealed blood, beaten so savagely he was unrecognisable to poor little Amelia. Blood was splattered all over the walls, the windows, the fireplace and the floor. A solitary Bible covered in blood lay on the sideboard as though it was just being read just before the attack had taken place. A blood-stained and broken shovel lay nearby, one of the weapons that caused the devastating blows to the victim. A broken pistol with blood and hair still on its handle was later found just outside the pub, laying on the track. Tom had a total of 16 wounds to the head, two of which fractured his skull. 
he had defensive wounds all over his body as a result from a frenzied and hysterical attack. Wading through the gory mass of blood, Amelia managed to reach the stairs. She ran up to check on her grandfather, Bill. Her shock turned to terror as she discovered her grandfather had also been brutally attacked. His bedclothes, a wash of deep red, blood dripping from his head to the bedclothes, to the floor. In shock, she immediately ran from the pub and headed to the nearest neighbour over at Ben Green, about 500 yards down from the Moor Cock Inn. Panicked, she called for Mr James Whitehead, who lived at Ben Green. He ran back to the horrifying scene and immediately sent a messenger for the doctor, a Mr Higginbottom from over at Upper Mill but it was clear there was very little he or anyone could do for the pair. They were both nearing the end of what was a slow and agonising death. Tom was too far gone. He made several attempts to raise himself up from the floor before falling again into the pool of his own blood. Struggling in the agonies of death, Tom was taken to bed, but due to the immense amount of injuries he sustained, he passed away even before they finished dressing his wounds. Attention was turned to Bill. He was in and out of consciousness, insensible and talking incoherently. (coughs) Blood pouring from a deep cut to the left side of his head. The fingers on his left hand had been cut to pieces and the body from head to foot was battered and covered in bruises. Bill must have put up as much as a fight as possible but his frail old body was overcome by the ferocity of their attack. Mr Higginbottom, the surgeon, tried to get a response from Bill what happened, Bill? Bill, what happened? Who did this to you? Who did it? But Bill was too weak. Gasping for his last breaths, with every ounce of strength he had, Bill deeply took his final breath. and mumbled a word that has caused controversy to this very day. Pats or plats. And he died. Tom, he was found in the main room lying in the right-hand corner, in front of an armchair. There were also severe damage to the walls in the pantry, with a blood-filled hole in the shape of someone's head imprinted upon it, and a mass of blood filled one of the corners. Bill, he was found upstairs in the bedroom, right above the main room below. From the trail of blood covering the stairs, it appears Bill was attacked on the ground floor and managed to get himself upstairs to the bedroom. With no witnesses of the attack and no survivors, the story of exactly what happened and who did it would remain locked in the blood-stained walls of the Moor Cock Inn forever. (laughs) 
with Bill's final word. This widened the mystery of what happened on that fateful night. As this single utterance could be taken in several different ways. Bill's final word was Pats or Platts. The word Pats being the, a derogatory term for the Irish at the time and Platt being a common local surname in this area. I mean, even their friend Reuben, his surname was Platt. Thomas and Reuben headed to Greenfield that very night of the attack. They both would have walked down in that direction, right along that path, right from where the Moorcock Inn stood here, right here. And when they passed down that path, they passed a gang of travelling Irishmen. Was it these who laid in wait and committed this horrific murder? I mean, being where we are, I mean, as you can see, it's very secluded here. There's plenty of places to hide with a clear visible view of where the pub once stood. The Irishman seen by Reuben Platt and Thomas when they were headed to Greenfield the night before the murders. Only Reuben's statement can confirm this, due to the other only witness now being dead. Reuben Platt was confident it was the Irishman who committed the murders. It's possible these men could have done it, they apparently headed in the direction of the Moorcock Inn. It's also likely that upon Tom's return from Greenfield, he stumbled in whilst a robbery was taking place, which ended in a double murder. If the final word of Bill before he died was actually Pats, then this was a usual term used to describe the Irish at the time and could fit the description of the assailants. Reuben is the closest witness to this entire case. He was the last person to see Bill and Tom alive on the night he headed into Greenfield. Could this whole testimony about the Irishman be a diversion away from himself? No one else witnessed the Irishman except for Reuben and Tom. Remember Tom, he went into the grocery shop, giving plenty of time for Reuben to potentially run back where he knew Bill was all alone in the pub. This is also reinforced with the final words that came from Bill's mouth, Pat's, or was it actually Platt? Reuben Platt was also... 63 years old when this happened. Could he have overpowered Tom, who was strong and fit? Unless he caught him with surprise. Who knows? John Mitchell was a labourer working on the roads and he made a startling confession some 13 years after the horrendous crime took place. Whilst drunk, he stated, I know more about the murders than you do. He said he was one of a group of men in the pub at the time and that he saw the initial attack against Bill. So John Mitchell was arrested. However, the local magistrate didn't believe the confession and described him as an idle drunk who frequently ill-used his wife, and so he was discharged. A servant girl, rumour had it who she was having an affair with Tom, and who almost certainly had one, if not two, of his children. 
The affair may be the reason that Tom was actually living at the pub with his father, Bill, having become estranged from his wife. Interestingly, Esther Porritt was accused of murdering her newborn child at the very same inquest as the Tom and Bill's inquest, and she was later convicted of the crime at York Crown Court. She was sentenced to six months imprisonment with hard labour at Wakefield House of Correction. A letter got sent to the Huddersfield Chronicle in 1853 from a Mr Robert Whitehead in Australia, in which he recounts meeting a man from a Saddleworth pub. The man stated his name was James Hill and that he had confessed to him a few years prior that he committed the murders. He said James Hill was a travelling peddler in Saddleworth at the time and had robbed and murdered Tom and Bill, though he had not intended to kill them. He then fled to Leicester, where he committed a further robbery, for which he was transported to Australia. There, he committed a murder, and was hanged in 1848. The Burns platters were peddlers and gypsies who periodically arrived on the moors to pick heather, in order to sell. These were a wild bunch of people who lived by their own laws. They had a long-running feud with Tom. Tom would try and extort money from them in order to allow them to pick heather. But with physical violence and threats of throwing them off the moors, Perhaps they decided enough was enough. Father and son James and Joseph Bradbury were accused of poaching and they were due to stand trial in Pontefract on this charge on the 3rd of April in 1832, the very day after the murders. Tom was due to testify against them in court and they were expected to receive harsh sentences. It would certainly be in their interest if Tom didn't show up to give evidence. There is also varying accounts of the Red Bradbury's shouting in a pub that Tom wouldn't live to make the trial. Whether this is true or not is subjective. As you can see, you could quite easily point the finger at any of these suspects. The problem was, there was no solid evidence to convict any of them. The inquest was held at William IV Public House in an upstairs room. With over 400 people in attendance both inside and outside the pub, After hearing from several people, including some of the suspects mentioned, the verdict was given. Murder against some persons or persons as yet unknown. A reward of £100 was offered, but never claimed, and remains unclaimed to this very day. At the inquest, they had on display the range of evidence taken from the Moorcock Inn at the time of the murders, including the shovel and the gun, the very weapons that caused the devastating final blows to Bill and Tom. The weapons and the evidence now sit in Saddleworth Museum. Unfortunately, the gun itself was stolen a long time ago, but the shovel and all the other evidence remains on display to the public. I'm here at Saddleworth Museum, and the curator, Mr Peter Fox, has very, very kindly allowed me to visit the museum before the public get here. And he's also got out of the display that they have on here about the Moorcock Inn. He's got out of the display William Bradbury's Bible. 
the same Bible he possibly was reading on the night of the murder, due to the blood stains on some of the pages. So let's take a wee look, folks. It's just right over here, and he's got this out for me. Now look at this, guys. Look at this. This is Bill Bradbury's actual Bible. It's the back cover there. This is the back cover. It's got writings on it. Possible fingerprints there. Um, if you look here, guys, this is the bloodstains. William Bradbury's actual bloodstains. And it's ancient. Now, now this Bible is dated about a hundred years prior to 1832. So this is like almost 300 year old Bible. Um, and this is William Bradbury's. And if you take a look on the inside cover, look at this guys, look at this. I'm just gonna flip that over. And if you ever look at there, that's got all signatures from the, from the Bradbury family including William's signature. Absolutely amazing. Look at that. And this is possibly the page that it was open on the night of the actual murder. Hence the blood. Look at that, folks. Absolutely incredible. So that's absolutely amazing. And it's, if you visit Saddleworth, Make sure you visit Saddleworth Museum because they have a dedicated display with the Bible and other artifacts all from the Saddleworth Moor murder, the original Moor's murders here in Saddleworth. So I'm here at the grave where Bill and Tom now rest in a long forgotten grave in the furthest corner of the graveyard of St Chad's Church here in Saddleworth. Now their grave is actually quite incredible and it looked amazing when it was first laid here. And Inscribed on top of the grave is a very poetic epitaph outlining the happenings on that dark and frightening night back in 1832. And now their grave is forgotten, neglected and fading away into history, just like their tragic story. So, as we do here on this channel, we like to leave as a mark of respect, a magical stone. So we're going to do that. I've got two magical stones here, one for Bill and one for Tom. So may they rest in peace. So I'm just going to leave these folks on the grave, right? Here we go. One for Bill and one for Tom. Here we are. And there's the grave, folks. So there you have it, folks. 
a tragic story of the original Moore's murders that happened almost 200 years ago. And what's so sad about it is that it still remains unsolved to this very day. Two men lost their lives in the most horrendous circumstances and no one paid the price for it. And it's such a shame. It really is. So, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And if this is your first time around here, hit that subscribe button to keep up to date with all my future fascinating stories and historic wonders. So until next time, folks, you all take care and all the best.